Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And it's been a while since I've taken a look at a video from Extra History. They're constantly making new great videos and I was looking at their channel and I thought, all right, which one am I gonna get into next? And I saw this one, Frederick the Great number one. Now this is a five part series that they've created. They did it a couple months ago, so we don't have to wait for parts three, four, and five. They're all already been released. And I thought, you know what? I haven't thought about Frederick the Great in a while. When I was a kid, one of my favorite games was Age of Empires 3, and for some reason I always picked the Germans as the nation to play as. And Frederick the Great was their leader in Age of Empires 3, and I remember him, or at least how the developers characterized him as being sort of cocky and very attitudinal, and I kind of liked that, you know, he was a bit of a, uh, a bit of a smack talker, right? And so I actually then started looking up a little bit more about him and researching him, and though I'm not... I don't know everything about his life and sort of his accomplishments to say that he's one of the founders of what would become Germany definitely rings true, right? The Kingdom of Prussia becoming one of the dominant ones in Europe is largely uh, due to his actions that he would take as the King of Prussia, though he did not start as that. And in this episode, his monstrous father will take a look at Frederick the Great's youth, and I'm excited. Let's get into it. November 6th. 1730. Frederick, Crown Prince of Brandenburg, Prussia, looks through the bars of his cell windows as soldiers lead his companion, Hans Hermann von Kata, to the Mound of Sand. I know where this Kata is Kata is more than his friend. He's the 18-year-old Frederick's confidant, his protector, and some say his lover. And he had tried to save Frederick from his father, the King of Prussia. And Kata would pay. Please forgive me, dear Kata, Frederick yells in French, the language they both prefer. Mm. In God's name, forgive me. So, so why he would yell that in French and not German is because at this point, French is really the secondary language of Europe. And so modernly, uh, English is obviously the secondary language of Europe, where if German and Italian meet, they're probably going to speak English uh, to each other if they don't speak each other's mother language. At this point in time, um, intellectuals, people of high status in society, they would all speak French. So the king's court, um, so those that have his advisors and everything like this, they would all be French speaking. And even English kings, right, were speaking French as well. German kings were speaking French. Italian kings were speaking French. Really, if French was the language of prestige at this point in Europe. And again, modernly, post Second World War, that's really become English. But at this point, French is the dominant one. There's nothing to forgive. Kata answers in the same language. I die for you with joy in my heart. The headsman steps up, revealing his axe. Frederick doesn't want to watch, but two soldiers, acting on his father's orders, grab hold of him and press his face to the bars. He screams, he fights, the axe raises over Kate's bare neck, and mercifully, the boy who would become Prussia's greatest king faints before he sees it fall. Yeah. Thanks so much to HelloFresh for continuing to help us bring history to the table. Hey everyone, as you can probably tell already, Frederick the Great's childhood was a horror show of abuse and homophobic bullying by his father. So with today's episode, viewer discretion is advised. Frederick the Great is one of the most dynamic monarchs of the 18th century. Inheriting a fractured piece of the Holy Roman Empire, a place so minor, its monarch was called King in Prussia <laughs> rather than King of Prussia, he expanded it. Okay, so why it was the king in Prussia and not the king of Prussia is actually a pretty simple reason. So let's go back here a little bit. So in 1730, these borders here, right? So you have the Habsburgs, obviously, but this is all, sorry, not Bohemian Silesia, but this is all belonging to the, the Holy Roman Empire. And so the king of the Ro Holy Roman Empire, the king of the Romans, is obviously the most it's the king. It's the most powerful man in the nation, right? And so with Brandenburg, Prussia, because you have Brandenburg, which is in the borders of the Holy Roman Empire, and you have Prussia itself, which is borders the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, because you have these two split pieces of territory, you can't have a king of Prussia because that would mean that you would have two kings in the Holy Roman Empire. And that that's not going Right, so because Brandenburg was an electorate, but they also had Prussia as well, it had to be the king in Prussia and not the king of Prussia. So there you go. Minor. Its monarch was called king in Prussia rather than king of... Also, I wouldn't say then it's that it's a minor, that it's so minor because of this. I don't know. But, I mean, there's still an electorate in the Holy Roman Empire. 
that makes him an important person. So, hey, whatever. Of Prussia, he expanded it to a major power. Known as a soldier and a philosopher, his reign simultaneously encompassed refinement and brutality, demonstrating both the splendor and slaughter of the Enlightenment. Yet his first battle was not against the Habsburgs or France, but rather his own dad. Frederick's hmm. father, Frederick William, was known as the Soldier King. Living in a sparse militaristic fashion, he despised anything he considered ostentatious or effeminate. In fact, his first act upon becoming the king in Prussia and the elector of Brandenburg was to sell his own father's jewels, horses, and fine furnishings. Okay. While many German princes used the treasury as their personal party fund, Frederick William instead pursued a conservative economic policy, curtailing state spending and battling corruption. Which was a wise thing overall, but many of the unnecessary expenses he eliminated included patronage of the arts, literature, and science. And spoiler alert, I might be getting ahead of myself here, but Frederick the Great, right? So his son will obviously go on to correct these. Frederick was one of the great patronages of the art and a real man of the Enlightenment, despite some of his military actions, which would definitely go against Enlightenment principles. But hey, we'll get to those. Like, he didn't just defund the Prussian Academy of Sciences. He closed it. But Frederick William did have one pet project, the army. So everything he saved, he poured into defense spending. He also created a new type of military draft, the Canton system that allowed Prussia to be able to recruit and train troops more efficiently and create civilian reservists that could be called upon. In that way, he doubled the size of the Prussian military to 76,000 men, making it the fourth largest army in Europe. Rough. Which is crazy, right? Think about that. So Brandenburg, Prussia at this point, is just that small little strip of territory, just one of many electorates in the Holy Roman Empire. And because of this system that is really, really influential in European uh, military strategy and, and sort of state organization overall, I mean, nowadays, obviously, we have, if you live in Germany, there is the German army, there is the French army, there's the Canadian army, the American army, the Japanese army, whatever, right? It's all very, it's obvious to us, right, that the state would centrally fund a military. But at this point in the 1700s, that wasn't all so clear, right? This is a gross oversimplification, but at this point, kings would basically hire standing armies with a ton of money to go out, fight their wars for them. And sometimes when they didn't pay them, the army would then come and overthrow them. You know, <laughs> that happens sometimes. And like I said, that's a large oversimplification. But the idea of centralizing an army so that a king didn't have to be, um, he didn't have to worry about his, his dukes and his other... Um, his other uh, royal, what would you say? What's the term I'm trying to use here? People of, of royal stature in the kingdom, right? If you would have it all centralized and then he could have full control of it, which means that he could implement these systems, right? The Canton systems and other things. So it's really kind of the ground level basis of what we understand of, of states having their own army that we have to this day. The same as that of France, which had 10 times Prussia's population. Oh, did this guy love the army. He dressed as a military officer, held meetings in rooms where he could watch troops drilling out his window, and in an additional extreme, drafted the tallest men in the Holy Roman Empire into a special unit of giants. And there's a weird story about this. I, don't, I actually don't know if this is true, but apparently Frederick then tried to have, have some of the tallest people in the kingdom then fornicate with some of the tallest women to basically create Prussian super soldiers. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's a historical myth, but I've heard that before. In fact, his council was so full of soldiers swilling beer and smoking footlong pipes that it was nicknamed the Tobacco Cabinet, mostly because their meeting room smelt like an airport smoking lounge. He also was prone to violent rages, which got worse as the years went on and had several medical conditions that kept him in constant pain. In other words, Frederick William projected an air of hyper-masculinity, Calvinist piety, and frugal financial habits. And naturally, he wanted his eldest surviving son Frederick, nicknamed Fritz, to grow up to be just like him, a hyper-virile religious soldier king, to use the great instrument of Prussian military power that he'd created. Now, the first six years of Fritz's life, he'd lived with his mother, and under her care, young Fritz developed what his father considered worrying habits. Fritz loved music and books. He grew incredibly close to his older sister, Wilhelmina, enjoyed poetry, philosophy, opera, and learned to play the flute. Worse than that, 
It was the transverse <laughs> flute recently invented in France. Oh, Frederick <laughs> William hated France and was known to fly into a rage if the country was even mentioned. The French, he said, were decadent and effeminate. So imagine his consternation when Fritz, who was tutored in French and German simultaneously, took to French as his first language and struggled with his native German. <sighs> Okay, all right, not a big deal. The yep. boy, Frederick William reasoned, just needed to find the fun in war, you know? So, for his sixth birthday, he gave him a miniature arsenal of military rifles and cannons, plus a group of boys in uniform he was supposed to order around as living toy soldiers. Ha <laughs> ha, pretty cool, eh, Fritz? <laughs> Fritz? No? It's fine, it's fine because Frederick William would- Right, and so what's important to note here is that obviously with the system that they have in place and that Frederick, so there's two Fredericks here, so let's go with Frederick William and Frederick the Great. So because Frederick the Great is going to inherit this kingdom, there's obviously the responsibility to train him to be a king, right? And obviously this has a massive amounts of responsibility. You're going to take over a kingdom and everything that Frederick Wilhelm, Wilhelm has created, right? You don't want the son then to destroy. And so, well, obviously, I don't agree with the methods here, right? But it's just important to note that he was seen as the heir, and he was the heir. And it was sort of prevalent to think, all right, well, we need to get him prepared for this, right? His whole life, his whole upbringing needs to be prepared to be the leader of this country. And how Prussian militarism saw it was to, you know, have living toy soldiers for your sixth birthday. But soon also shape his son more directly. For as was tradition, the next year when he turned seven, the responsibility for raising and educating Fritz transferred from his mother to his father. As you can imagine, all studies of music, philosophy, and poetry were promptly shut down. The prince would instead now have a grueling regimented schedule of Latin, religious studies, ancient classics, modern political history, and military subjects, conducted largely by military officers. But even there, Fritz found allies his Latin tutor was sympathetic to his clearly bright charge and not only procured him a flute, but helped him amass a secret library of 3,000 books covering poetry, enlightenment philosophy, and art. Fritz also visited a nearby court in Saxony, which gave him a glimpse of a freer life than he'd had. Yet as Frederick grew into a teenager, Frederick William became increasingly furious over his heir, who he considered effeminate, incompetent, and irreligious as it was increasingly clear that Fritz was an agnostic. So he responded with a campaign of abuse. Frederick- Was he agnostic or was he atheist? I mean, there's a, obviously a clear distinction there where atheists reject the notion of there being a God and agnostics, well, you know, they can't disprove it, so they sort of sit in the middle. I, I thought that the sort of modern understanding was that he was probably more atheistic, but I don't know. William berated his son. Screaming at him in front of soldiers, he burned... Uh, the key point here, too, by the way, either way, whether agnostic or atheistic, is that <laughs> this is the 1700s. This is going to be the future king in Prussia, a, f a future electorate of the Holy Roman Empire. And he just not taken to the religious thing, <laughs> right? You can see how he's sort of out of the mold here for a monarch, and so as was he later with his reforms and everything, is that he was he was always just a little bit, um, you know, not not the typical characteristic monarch. There was a couple little things that made it interesting about uh, Frederick. Books and artwork he found and assaulted him in public. He would strike young Frederick for sleeping in and being late for drill or for being unsure on horseback. Once he beat him with a cane for wearing a pair of gloves when it was cold. If I had disgraced my father so, he once told Fritz, I would have killed myself. Then, when Fritz was 16 and nice formed guy. an intimate relationship with one of his father's pages, Frederick William had the young man sent to a border posting and beat his son again, calling him a sodomite. Now, a quick aside here. The language surrounding Frederick's sexuality can be a hot button topic among historians. Definitely. Not whether he was gay. He clearly was attracted to men, preferred male partners, and commissioned art with homoerotic themes. The debate is more about terminology. Whether labels like gay are imposing a modern idea of sexuality on a very different time and culture. But sure. let's be honest, in history, it's already common to use a ton of terms like feudalism or democracy to describe things that existed but didn't yet have labels, and queer people existed then as they always have. So with all that in mind, Frederick was gay, and his sexuality definitely made it dangerous for him to live under Frederick William. 
Yeah, true. And I mean, the question is, is that whether he was sexually attracted to men, whether this was a romantic thing, right? How he may have been possibly asexual, but was more romantically involved. That's a whole debate for, I'll, I'll leave that for the historians. But if you're ever interested, just look it up. There's a few different uh, ways of looking at that. At this point, he had only one hope to escape his father, a double marriage. See, his mother had been planning to marry his sister, Wilhelmina, and him to the children of her brother, George II of England. Fritz was all about this. He could go to England, which was far freer than Prussia. And look, if he had to get married to get away from his father, that was a small price. But when that deal fell apart due to intrigue and shifts in alliances, he plunged into despair. That was when Kata, his- Yeah, and it was basically because Prussia did not want to be not really a puppet state, but basically be, what would you say, in debt of the British Empire, to be influenced by the British Empire, right? It was more interested in, in at this point, I believe, forging closer ties with Austria rather than um, Britain. But Prussia, as we'll th see throughout this series, is more than willing to just switch sides on a dime to, uh, to be able to get the most out of the uh, whatever conflict is going on. His friend, tutor, and likely lover, agreed to help him escape. They would slip away while touring the Holy Roman Empire and flee together to England, though they were caught almost immediately and thrown into prison. Yeah. Given both were military officers, Frederick William charged them with treason and seriously considered having Fritz executed, but that put him on rocky legal ground with the rest of the empire. So in the end, his punishment was to watch Kata die. Afterward, Frederick made a deal with his father. In return for a pardon and getting to stay crown prince, he submitted to an even more grueling and austere routine of tutors. He also swore to be a good Protestant and agreed to marry. So. Sorry, Protestant or Calvin? I'm, I'm messing this up. This is one thing that I really don't know too much about, but then Calvinist and Protestant, is Calvinism then a sub-denomination of Protestantism or uh, Lutheran question mark? Help me out here in the comment section below because I'm just, I'm not too familiar with that. He entered an engagement with Elizabeth Christine, a Protestant cousin of the Habsburg line. Though yep. Frederick was despondent over this choice and swearing that even friendship between them was impossible, he threatened suicide, however, still had no choice in the marriage. But he knew the only way out was through. Frederick wept upon meeting her and on their wedding night, loitered in their bedroom for an hour before abruptly leaving to stroll the grounds until dawn. But no matter, he was safe, he was free, and he only needed to wait until the soldier king died, and when he took power, he would never be beaten again. Yes. For in a surprise to all, Frederick William's tutelage had taken root, and his son would be a warrior king like Prussia had never seen. And while we wait to find out what happens to Frederick next time, I say we go make a meal fit for a king. There you go, fantastic. Thank you very much for joining me. One thing I wanna put on this and that I, they might mention in the beginning of the episode, but Frederick the Great would later say about his father that although he was a terrible person, right, he was a horrible man, is that he was certainly a good leader, right? He was a good leader for what Prussia needed at the time. He made a lot of political advancements, a lot of economic advancements, and Although Frederick would not live to see it, this is really one of the founding, one of the foundations of the eventual unification of Germany in 1871. And though, again, that wouldn't happen for another 100 and 140 years, nonetheless, the seeds are being sown for the eventual unification of the country. Thank you very much for joining me on this one. If you like, if you like this video, let me know in the comment section below and then I'll do two and three. I'll probably do both together. Maybe I'll do one at a time. I'm not sure. But I'll finish the series off. It is five parts, so it's a bit of a longer one. And I'll also be doing the Napoleon series in between then. So thank you very much. Let me know what you think down below. Thank you for your support. I appreciate it. Till the next one.